Welcome back, everybody. This week, we're going to be talking about Impressionism, which is the most important art movement right on the heels of realism. Now, by the time we're talking about Impressionism and then post-Impressionism, we're talking about a group of artists that we can refer to as the avant-garde. Um, the term really means the vanguard. It's a, it's a military term originally. The avant-garde were the forward units of an advancing army who were meant to go ahead and to scout out territory. But the term begins to be used to refer to artists that were moving ahead of the public taste, along with collectors and critics and dealers who were supporting them. So we started already to see this idea with realism, that this was a style that originally was very not appreciated by um, its audience. And the same thing is going to be true of Impressionism. Now, let me just start by saying that the term Impressionism, which we use to sort of blanketly refer to an entire group of artists who emerge in the 1870s, was not a positive term. But we will talk a little bit more of that later. Now, this is not Impressionism. We looked at Edouard Manet's Le Déjeuner sur l'herbe, or The Luncheon on the Grass, in our unit on realism. Remember, this is the work that was shown at the Salon de Refusé in 1863. But I'm using it as a starting point to show the place where the Impressionists began. Manet, by the way, was friends with most of the major artists of the Impressionist groups, which were centered in and around Paris. And this, by the way, is a Paris that is quite lively and growing. Um, the size and the population of Paris had doubled between 1830 and 1850, and again by 1870. So this is a big growing um, city with a huge artistic center. So it is really out of Edward Manet that we get to the first Impressionist that we're going to talk about, and the one that we're going to talk about the most in this unit, which is Claude Monet. Now, Claude Monet was very much inspired by the slightly older Manet, and particularly the work The Déjeuner sur l'herbe. He took up very similar issues in one of Monet's early pictures, which is called Women in the Garden. Now, a little bit about Monet. Uh, Monet was born in Paris in 1840. His father was a small businessman who originally did not approve of his son's interest in art, and Monet had been drawing since he was a young boy, but eventually agreed to sort of support his career financially if he would place himself with a um, with a serious artist with which to study. His earliest studies are with which painters of the Barbizon school, the ones who were painting in the forests of Fontainebleau. And so that is where Monet really gets his background, was as a painter of landscape. And you can see that in this work. Now, Monet is a very different kind of artist. The Barbizon painters usually associated the landscape with mood. They liked mysterious lightings of twilight and of dawn, and there's this sense of brooding seriousness to the landscape, which is something that is wholly absent in Monet. Now, Monet early on has really the same ambitions as someone like Manet. He wants to show his works at the Salon and have them accepted by the sort of art establishment. And this was one of his early attempts to do so. Um, he had attempted to make a large, very large scale painting of a luncheon on a grass, like literally inspired very much by um, by Manet's painting shortly before this one, but the picture, he never even finished it, and the work is, is incomplete and in ruins. But Monet in 1866 decided to work on this picture, which was Women in the Garden. So you can see the inspiration from Manet. We have four figures set inside a landscape. What is absent at this point is the reference to the sort of classical art past. In other words, you remember Manet's picture was a modern take on 
a Renaissance painting, whereas Monet's picture, though it's inspired by Manet, is insistently contemporary, which is something you could see by looking at the dress of the four figures. Now, like Manet, he was trying to paint a large scale composition of figures outside in nature. And though this wasn't as large as his previous attempt to do this, um, this is still about eight and a half feet high, which as we said for Manet's pictures, once you have a picture of everyday life, which is what this is, painted on a large scale, and this is again larger than the most readily available large pre-stretched canvas, it would have announced that it was an important picture and that broke with convention. A picture of this sort should be small. Um, now, one of the problems Monet was having is that he was interested in painting outside in nature. And that was a big problem if you wanted to paint a very, very large work of art. It was hard to move canvases. And so very often artists doing a work like this would make a small oil sketch, meaning a very quick sketch like oil painting outside from nature in natural light, looking at what you want to paint. And then they would work the pictures up into their finished versions in the studio. But Monet found that that caused a lot of problems for him because um, the, the, it, the work would lose its immediacy when it was repainted and all the things that worked about capturing the effects of the light. Um, once they were transposed and rethought and put onto a big canvas, the brush strokes changed and the work was a different work of art. Now, Monet did eventually with this picture, he tried to work outside from nature. In fact, he dug a really large trench so that this picture could be lowered into the ground. So picture you wanted to paint um, a work of art like this and it's of this big scale, you either need to build scaffolding so you could reach the top of the picture, but then that would change your viewpoint of the objects you were looking at. And so he devised this hoisting mechanism so that he could lower it down so he could paint the upper portion, portions of the work without changing his viewpoint. Now what's interesting is even though this is a picture about um, four figures like Manet's was, Manet's pictures were, was very much about the figures, whereas this is much more about the landscape. The figures, in fact, are a little bit of an afterthought in a way. They seem, I think, to Monet to give the picture a subject. Um, it's not a real scene. He had um, a woman named Camille, who was at this point his girlfriend. He would later, she would later be his wife. Um, Camille posed for all four of the figures in the composition. Um, so it's a little bit of an artifice. Um, Camille, by the way, was a model. She posed for other painters at the time as well and was not of a very high station in life. Um, so Monet's parents very much um, resented their relationship. They had nothing to do with her even after they married and his Monet's parents wouldn't even recognize the two children that she bore him. Um, now, okay, so this is a picture that really studies the landscape and particularly you can see Monet's tremendous interest in light, which you could argue is the real subject of the work. Monet captures the effect of strong light shining through the trees and the way it dapples on the walk and on the grass in the foreground, making patterns on the seated woman's dress. Also in common with Manet is this tremendous interest in the flat surface of the paint, the materiality of the paint, which is often implied, impl applied quite thickly, um, and a calling attention to the surface. Again, we don't see things like modeling. Um, painters like Monet started working um, with unblended colors directly on the surface of the painting. And so you could see, even when you look at the grass, he's not transitioning from light to shade. He's simply working with two or three different shades of green and applying them separately. So this was a success for Monet because he actually succeeded in making a work of the subject of Monet and he completes it and he submits it to the salon in 1867 and it was rejected, which was a huge blow for Monet. And this was a big effort and expense for a young, very poor artist because very often he 
um, turn down his father's help in favor of keeping his relationship with Camille. Um, the work, by the way, instead, he ended up exhibiting in the window of an art dealer where it was eventually purchased by a painter and then it was eventually acquired by Monet. And after Monet's death, Monet gets the work back. So it's not totally an early success for Monet. And yet we start to see what Monet's interests are going to be. Monet is becoming one of the earliest painters who really embraces the idea of a plein air painting or working on plein air is what we would say, which means painting directly outside from nature. And that sounds like something really obvious, but not that many artists did such a thing. Leonardo da Vinci in the Renaissance, I think, was quite exceptional for at least making drawings outside from the landscape. But this becomes something of critical importance for the Impressionists. You know, this was only really, really possible when we talk about the 19th century. And that's because, as we mentioned in our lecture on realism, painters were working from paint that came in tubes and from canvases that were pre-stretched, which made it possible for artists to transport their workshop to outdoor locations. I mean, think about that. In earlier times, when an artist wanted to paint with blue paint, his assistants had to take ground up pigment and mix the oil and get the right consistency. It wasn't a portable process. But once artists are working from industrial paint in tubes, everything changes. Um, this, by the way, is a wonderful little painting made by um, Pierre-Auguste Renoir, who we'll talk about a little bit later, and it's a painting of Monet painting outside from his garden to show what that practice meant and what it looked like. So plein air painting becomes a very important early idea and one that these early artists really have to struggle with. Now we can see this is the year after Monet's Women in the Garden was rejected. We could see that what ends up happening with Monet is he abandons the idea of working in large scale, which really was because they were trying to get these works submitted to the salon and for those works to be noticeable in the salon. After all, it was the salon that said important works had to be large. So Monet abandons this and starts to work on a smaller format that he's going to stick with until the end of his life when he thinks about monumentality again. But this is an early work by Monet, a sort of experiment called On the Bank of the Seine, Benicourt. So the Seine is uh, the river outside and around Paris, in Paris. Um, and it is the kind of subject that artists like Monet begin to gravitate to. Again, painting from nature, painting very often in these sort of suburban resort-like settings. So this is actually something that uh, Monet painted when he was staying at a small village near Giverny in 1868. So at this point, we are moving towards Impressionism, and we haven't even really talked about what that means yet, but we will. So the subject of this painting is simply a view of a river with a tremendous sort of glass-like stillness of its surface, while we look from the opposite side of the bank towards um, sort of an embankment of houses in the distance. In the foreground, we see a woman posed for by Camille, though it doesn't really matter. We can't see her face. Um, and you can see where this idea, first of all, of plein air painting now becomes really truly solidified. Monet is painting the environment that he's in. And we can also see again how much this interest in color and especially color and light are becoming the subjects of the work more than what those things represent. So what does that mean? So, okay, our idea, when we look at the world around us, it is light, which transport images to our brain. We receive this information, but our brain already reads what we see around us as identifiable recognizable three-dimensional objects in space. Our brain does that work for us. But Monet was talking about 
painting in a new way, a kind of painting that was based on pure visual experience. Now, Monet, what's nice for us is Monet actually talked quite a bit about what he was doing. And so here is what he says. Monet says, when you go out to paint, try to forget what objects you have before you, a tree, a house, a field, or whatever. Merely think, here's a little square of blue, here is an oblong of pink, here a streak of yellow, and paint it just as it looks to you, the exact color and shape, until it gives you your own naive impression of the scene before you. Monet at one point explains that you should paint as if you were a blind person who had just regained their sight. And what he's talking about is this idea of not allowing your brain to transpose what you see, that chair in front of you, into a chair, but to literally just see it as color and light. And that is what this picture purports to do. And you can see him experimenting with these ideas. So, for example, when we look, we see in the background, we could see this horizontal line of uh, a hillside, and we can see those trees, and then down towards the edge of the water, it gets a little bit beachy, and we could see boats and people. And then below, we can see those the sort of reflections on the water down here. And what's interesting with Monet is that he paints the forms that are real, quote unquote, like the houses, right? You can see there's a house behind this tree and you can see the houses here. He paints the reflection of one of these houses with the same solidity as he paints the houses. You see what I'm saying? Why? Well, because he sees color and light of the landscape of the sky on the water and so it's the same thing as the houses and the hillside and the sky. It's made up of those same patches of, of light and color. And it doesn't really matter that one is three-dimensional and solid, and one is this ephemeral reflection sort of bouncing along on the water. Now, as I said, Monet is getting really close to what the Impressionists are going to be doing. Um, he does still have some problems. And in fact, the woman he puts in the foreground, he adds as an afterthought in his studio. In other words, he still isn't truly committing to simply painting visual experience. He's still thinking about turning that work into sort of a, a, a finished object. Speaking of finish, we start to see when we look at this work that there's not that much of it. You know, we don't see details of blades of grass in the grass or leaves on the trees. They're very sort of hastily rendered. You can make them out, but you can see they're just jabs of the brush. We don't even see the sitter's face, just a single, like a single brush stroke, which becomes the side of her cheek to substitute for a face. So, well, what do we make of that? So. When Monet says paint what you see, you have to stop for a second and ask yourself, what does it mean to see? There's different kinds of seeing. Um, you could walk down the street and pass a car, and then a minute later I could say, what was the license plate number on that car? And odds are you're not going to know unless you were purposefully looking. Well, why not? You saw the car. It was th That license plate was visible to you. But there's different kinds of seeing. There is careful, meticulous seeing when you study an object. And an artist who's interested in that would paint every flaw on the bark of the tree. They would distinguish every leaf. They would paint the hairs on this woman's head and the blades of grass. That's one kind of seeing. But what Monet is really getting interested in is the idea of a glance, right? That moment when you open your eyes, and he says you should paint like a blind person who's just regained their sight, you open your eyes, what do you see? Instantly, it's the glance that he's interested in. So we're not gonna be interested in a lot of surface detail. We're gonna be interested in the immediacy of the moment when that light hits your eye and you can see form. And it was at Nadar's studio that these group of artists exhibited their works. 
there were about 35 artists and they had about 163 works between them and they opened up their exhibition right around the same time as the salon though it was very different um, at the salon about 400,000 people would have seen an artist's work compared to the 3,500 visitors which came to this exhibition but it was a big step and it was the first in 1874, the first Impressionist exhibition, but there would be seven more exhibitions between 1876 and 1886. Now I'm showing you just a sampling of the works that were shown at the first exhibition and some of the painters. Um, there was one woman included in the exhibition and we talked during our realism section about how challenging it was to be a female painter during the 19th century. But you can see in the bottom middle, the painting The Cradle by Berthe Marceau. And there actually, she, she submitted quite a few works to this exhibition. Um, and you can read more about Berthe Marceau's um, contribution. You can hear more about it in a video I have included on our webpage for this chapter, for this unit. Um, when you look at the works, we're going to notice certain things about the Impressionists. They're going to abandon all of the traditionally um, important subjects. They're not going to paint big religious paintings or mythological paintings or history paintings. Instead, they choose the world that they see around them. And so most of the Impressionists choose things like landscapes, the urban, the urban sort of um, cityscape, um, domestic scenes and interiors, still lives. In fact, a lot of the subjects they choose were the subjects that traditionally were deemed the least important. Now, as I said, um, the reaction to the exhibition, uh, there were not that many people who came and they all paid a franc or something like that to go. Um, but the reaction of the critics was horrifying. Um, the critics in general responded very poorly to these pictures and they called the painters lunatics um, and they really were quite harsh. Um, this is, by the way, just a, a caricature that appeared in, the, in a newspaper um, that shows you the sort of reaction of horror at people to seeing the Impressionist exhibition. Um, just so an idea of this, I'm going to read you a little bit of a long passage, but I think it's important, um, which is by the critic Albert Wolf. Now, he wasn't talking about the first Impressionist show. This is actually a review he makes of the second Impressionist exhibition, but it's really important to see the kind of reaction people had. And Albert Wolf writes the following. Le Rue Le Pelletier has had bad luck. After the opera fire, here is a new disaster overwhelming the district. At Duran Ruelles, there's just opened an exhibition of so-called paintings. The inoffensive passerby, attracted by the flags that decorate the facade, goes in, and a ruthless spectacle is offered to his dismayed eyes. Five or six lunatics, among them a woman, a group of unfortunate creatures stricken with the mania of ambition have met there to exhibit their works. Some people burst out laughing in front of these things. My heart is oppressed by them. Those self-styled artists give themselves the title of non-compromisers, impressionists. They take up canvas, paint, and brush, throw on a few tones haphazardly, and sign the whole thing. It is a frightening spectacle of human vanity gone astray to the point of madness. Try to make Monsieur Pizarro understand that trees are not violet, that the sky is not the color of fresh butter, that in no country do we see the things he paints, and that no intelligence can accept such aberrations. Try indeed to make Monsieur Degas see reason. Tell him that in art there are certain qualities called drawing, color, execution, control, and he will laugh in your face and treat you as a reactionary. 
or try to explain to Monsieur Renoir that a woman's torso is not a mass of flesh in the process of decomposition, with green and violet spots which denote the state of complete putrefaction of a corpse. Seriously, these lunatics must be pitied. Benevolent nature endowed some of them with superior abilities, which could have produced artists. But in the mutual admiration of their common frenzy, the members of this group of vain and blustering extreme mediocrity have raised the negation of all that constitutes art to the height of a, of a principle. They've attached an old paint rag to a broomstick and made a flag of it. Since they know perfectly well that complete absence of artistic training prevents them from ever crossing the gulf that separates an effort from a work of art, they barricade themselves within their lack of capacity which equals their self-satisfaction, and every year they return before the salon opens with their ignominious oils and watercolors to make a protest against the magnificent French school which has been so rich in great artists. I know some of these troublesome impressionists. They are charming, deeply convinced young people who seriously imagine they have found their path. This spectacle is distressing. Now you'll notice that the critic referred to them as impressionists. It was not a title that they gave to themselves. Um, because again, it was only a sort of a loose collaboration, even though they agreed to exhibit their works together. The title was named as a sort of derogatory jab of the movement based on this painting called Impression Sunrise, um, which Monet exhibits at that first Impressionist show. So now we start to see from the criticism what it was that Impressionism, what that term means. Now you can look at the term Impressionism the way that Monet means to say, this is an impression. When you say, what's your, what's your impression of that person? It's usually like, what's your first reaction? What's your immediate reaction? This is the impression that Monet is thinking about. But to the critics, it meant works that looked haphazard, unfinished, unskilled. You know, the works in the salon and the works that people's eye were used to are ones that the artist would have made a detailed underdrawing for, then would have worked the canvas up over a long period of time, and they would have applied lots of finish and small detail, small brush strokes and a smooth surface to the work of art. And Monet's picture was anything but that. By the way, even the subject here is really quite brilliant. He chooses sunrise. Don't you guys have that friend where every time you go somewhere, they decide that we should all wake up and go to the beach or go to the mountains and watch the sunrise? And what's amazing about sunrise is how quickly it's over. It happens, it seems, in an instant. And the sky changes constantly. And Monet and the Impressionist realize, especially when you're painting outside from nature, there's no such thing as a permanent view. You know, to paint the landscape, you're trying to fix something in time, but a landscape is changing constantly. It's always in motion. The water moves, the breeze blows, the light changes, the clouds pass. And so Monet is trying to capture the most ephemeral time of landscape, which is the sunrise on a picture. It seems almost impossible, you see, because what Monet says he wants to do by painting a glance, painting the moment you regain your sight, painting the, the sunrise is hard because there's this disparity between how quickly you see and how quickly the sunrise occurs and how long it takes to make a painting. But you can see Monet becoming interested in painting as quickly, as rapidly as possible. And you can see why the critics reacted to this. Here we're looking at this view of a harbor. And again, the Impressionists were painting the world around them. So this is sort of the Industrial Revolution. This is this industrialized harbor of Paris. And so we can see a few um, maybe fishing boats, like paddle boats, rowboats in the foreground, but in the background we can see smokestacks of the industrial harbor, and we can see this bluish gray haze over the surface, which is probably a combination of smog 
and fog. And yet, remember, it's important, the Impressionists are saying they're not painting subjects, they're not painting boats, um, they're painting color and light. So that's important to remember, because if you look at this picture from another perspective, you could say, ah, oh, this is a comment about industrialization and the rise of the city and the old way and the new way. That's not what it is for Monet. He's interested in color and light, not in the subject. And so the Impressionists on the whole choose subjects that they don't comment on. It is just this neutral sort of visual experience and observation. They're not political. And that's very different from what we saw with the artists from realism, who by and large were intensely political. You have to imagine that with all the chaos that happened in the early 1870s, a period of calm would have been something that artists and Parisians in general would have been quite interested in. So again, it's without comment, but we could see this peachy, orangey, sun rising up, and then we can see um, the reflections in the water, which are really, really just quick dashes of paint with a very impostoed surface. And impasto is that thick three-dimensional application of paint, um, where the paint itself has texture and thickness. But you can see these are just really quick strokes. And the sense of movement on the water are just these rapid dabs of his brushes. Um, so again, that term impressionism comes from this picture and the critics latched onto it and dubbed um, it dubbed the entire movement impressionism. So this sort of sketchy quality this would have been appropriate for an oil sketch, but not for a finished work of art. And so that becomes the real contribution of Monet and the Impressionists. But what we're gonna do now is look at some of the other artists in this movement, because they all have strikingly different perspectives. Next, we can look at one of Monet's contemporaries, who is Pierre-Auguste Renoir. Can I say, you know what's a fun thing to do? If you find an artist you're interested in, set up Google News Alerts on your phone so that every time this artist appears in the news, you get an email. It is fascinating. I mean, I'm a Renaissance person, so I do it for Leonardo da Vinci and Michelangelo, unless there's a Ninja Turtle movie out and then it's a nightmare. But you'd be amazed at some of the interesting stories that pop up in the news. In 2015, I don't know, some Instagrammer with a faux beef against Renoir organized a group of people to create these satirical, I think, protests outside, first of the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, and then later at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, arguing against the existence of Renoir in art museums. I mean, this is fascinating, it's entertaining. They all just talk about how bad Renoir is as a painter, which is really kind of funny. I think at the Metropolitan Museum, there was actually one counter protester with a sign saying that you'll have to take Renoir from our cold dead hands, something to that effect. Um, by the way, there was also another interesting story in 2017, peripherally related to Renoir, which is that President Trump had given a few interviews in an apartment with a Renoir on the wall and um, had been asked by a reporter if it was authentic and he said that it was and it turns out it was a fake, it was a copy and the real one was in a museum for decades. So it is fun sometimes to see where um, artists appear in the news. And can I just tell you when this happened, I giggled these 2015 protests because I have had the hardest time learning to like Renoir. He is the artist who is still the biggest challenge for me. Um, there's a huge collection of Renoir paintings in Washington, D.C. at the Barnes Foundation. And Renoir sometimes is difficult to like. But we're going to work on it. I mean, he has some masterpieces. There can be no doubt. And really, one of them is the Moulin de la Galette. Um, you can see from the first impression that he's a very different artist than someone like Monet. So Monet comes at Impressionism from this wholly empirical point of view. 
you paint only what you see, and you don't see that in Renoir. Renoir still feels a little bit more traditional, and he's still making a composition. He's not just painting how things happen to be. He's um, using his taste and his feeling, and he's painting much more of a mood. You sense it's not just about light and color. And the truth of it is that he was, at heart, a figure painter, which is something that Monet isn't really. Um, so, but he was trying to take this impressionist technique, um, this interest in the momentary and the passing and the studying of the quality of light and applying it to a large scale figure painting. You remember how much Monet struggled with this when we looked at his Women in the Garden. Now, this is not quite as large, but still created challenges for Renoir, who wanted to paint the work on sight. Now this, by the way, what we're looking at is a scene set inside a very popular dance hall in Montmartre, which is a place where, you know, young people would go and spend Sunday afternoon. So it is a subject of sort of like middle class suburban leisure which was a new category of painting. It really is a new sort of genre of painting and something that the Impressionists were very much drawn to. These ideas of, of sort of like suburban seaside, but then also city spaces that were for um, leisure. So in other words, scenes of dining, concerts, ballet, opera, dancing, Right, these cafe scenes, these become a new category of works and something again that the Impressionists were drawn to. So it was a chance to paint a big, large scale figure painting, but there's no narrative, there's no moralizing theme, there's no story. It's just, again, the sense of the everyday instantaneous that he's trying to transpose into this work. Um, in order to paint it, Renoir leased a studio um, that was nearby and he kept it for about a year and a half while he worked on this picture. So again, you saw Monet try to paint quicker and quicker. That's not possible when you're working on a large scale canvas and Renoir, unlike Monet, by the time Monet evolves as an impressionist artist, would do significant preparatory work. He would make drawings, but he did carry this picture. Every day he was working over to the dance hall and work on it. And one of his friends recorded that in a letter. He wrote, we would carry this canvas every day from the Rue Courteau to the Moulin because the painting was to be executed entirely on the spot. This was not without difficulties when the wind blew and the big canvas threatened to fly away like a kite. And that I think was still even a mid-size version of this picture. Ultimately, this version, the final one, it was too large and um, Renoir had to invite his friends and the friends he had made at the cafe back to his uh, studio so he could paint them there. So again, some of the spirit of Impressionism, but some of it is very much different. So, well, how do we still have this idea of Impressionism? And first of all, we can see it in his brushwork. So the entire surface of this picture is covered with thick brush strokes, this very um, agitated, animated, lively application of the paint. Um, applied in different directions, but again, very thick, visible brush strokes with more finish than we see in Monet, but still a considerable lack of surface detail and of things like modeling. Um, you can see, for example, the tremendous interest in the light, which is something, of course, that we saw with Monet and how carefully he's studying the sort of dappled effect, effects as sunlight um, comes down through the trees. And as we saw with Monet, he paints this colored light with the same solidity as he paints the forms that occupy them. Um, you'll notice with the, with, with the Impressionist in general, the palette of colors is different than it is in a lot of traditional paintings. There's quite a bit of black in this picture because of the clothing of the people, these fashionably dressed young folk. Um, but the Impressionists generally painted very little black in nature. You know, there's an awareness that 
shadows are not black. Shadows are composed of a wide variety of color. And you can see some of that even in looking in this work. Um, it's again, it's supposed to look very casual and Renoir makes some interesting choices with the cropping around the work. So it's kind of interesting when you're an artist, you start with a canvas and you want to fit the scene into the canvas. Renoir is working here a little bit like a photographer, it seems, in mentality. In other words, it's almost as if he's choosing his shot from a larger world. So for example, what I mean by that is if you look at this woman and child, Renoir could have arranged the composition so they fit wholly within the frame, but instead he abruptly cuts her face and cuts the edge off of this bench so it's hard to really make out what the form is, or this chair. Those sorts of abrupt cropping um, are something that are influenced by photography. They sort of, you know, it looks like the frame sort of accidentally cuts things. Um, it also is something that's going to be influenced by Japanese art, which we're going to talk about in just a few moments. Now, even though we don't think of an artist like Monet to be a figural painter in the way that we think of Renoir as one, he did paint the figure. Um, and this picture I just wanted to show you briefly because it is so interesting in thinking about the evolution of Monet's theory of sort of painting optically. This is a painting that Monet makes in 1879 of his wife Camille on her deathbed. Camille died at the age of 32. Um, from pelvic cancer, maybe cervical cancer. Um, she had not, she just recently had their second child and that had apparently weakened her considerably. And so Monet paints her on this bed with a sort of shroud over her, made all out of these blues and grays. Interestingly, so this is obviously the kind of picture that we would look at as being very emotional and biographical. And yet Monet wrote the following to a friend he said, one day when I was at the deathbed of a woman who had been and still was very dear to me, I caught myself, my eyes fixed on her tragic forehead in the act of mechanically analyzing the succession of appropriate color gradations, which death was imposing on her immobile face, tones of blue, of yellow, of gray, what have you. This is the point I had reached. Certainly it was natural to wish to record the last image of a woman who was departing forever. But even before I had the idea of setting down the features to which I was so deeply attached, my organism automatically reacted to the color stimuli, and my reflexes caught me up in spite of myself, in an unconscious operation which was the daily course of my life, just like an animal turning his mill. So again, we have Monet declaring that even almost now against his will, rather than being able to record something for sentimental purposes, he sees her purely in the form of color and light and the stimuli that reach his eyes. It is still, by the way, that same impressionistic style with the very quick brushstroke. But again here, the subject matter is very extraordinary. Now, before we leave Impressionism, I want to quickly go through some of the other most important masters, and one among those would be Edgar Degas. Now, Degas had a very sort of traditional background. He studied in art school. He worked like Manet did with copying the works of old masters in the museums. And in fact, he went to Italy, which was a very common thing for artists of some means to do. So they could go study the works of antiquity and the works of the Renaissance. But he meets Manet in 1862, and that might have been what caused him to sort of abandon his more traditional subjects and instead look towards the everyday subjects that we began to associate with the Impressionists. So Manet sort of brings him towards the Impressionist group, um, and he did exhibit 
in not only the first Impressionist exhibition, but in fact, he only missed one of eight of them. So he was a very active participant. And yet he was very different than the Impressionists in terms of his outlook. And this is something that he acknowledges. In fact, Degas said, no art was ever less spontaneous than mine. What I do is the result of reflection and study of the great masters, of inspiration, spontaneity, temperament, I know nothing. So while we think about the immediacy, the impression of the Impressionists, he argues that he's doing something else. And in fact, he also doesn't share the interest in plein air painting that we saw in artists like Monet and Renoir. He worked in indoor subjects very often and he painted very much in his studio. Now, this is a different kind of object because we need to talk first about medium. Now, that is funny because I don't think I've said the word medium to you yet, but as much as we spend time looking at um, subject matter and composition, the choice of materials or medium for the artist is important as well. And this is a medium we haven't yet seen. Most of what we've been looking at so far in this class have been oil paints on um, the surface of canvas. Uh, this, in fact, is different. This is pastel on cardboard. So just to make a little bit of a point about medium, because these choices were very important for an artist. First of all, pastel is a medium that's made out of dried sticks of powdered pigment. So it comes in different kinds because the pigments need to be mixed with a binder to keep it together so it can be turned into these short sticks. If a lot of binder is put into it, you'll have a harder stick um, and it'll be pale or less saturated in color because the binder will dilute it. Or you can work in softer sticks which have less binder um, and you get more saturated color. But you need to apply some sort of a fixative to keep it onto the paper because pastel can literally fall off the sheet. And so artists usually worked in a rougher grained surface like a paper with a what we call a tooth to it so it's got like texture to it that were meant to sort of hold the medium um, now there might be a reason that Degas is doing this in 1885 right around then um, Degas is 40 years old and it's around around then that he begins to have trouble with his vision and he will increasingly lose his sight it will degenerate for the rest of his life and that might be one of the reasons that he turns towards pastel. So if you think a little bit about how an artist works, so if you're painting, you're holding a brush and at the end of your brush, you've got the bristles and the paint is on the bristles and the paint bristles are what touch the canvas. So your hand is pretty far from the surface that's receiving the image. However, working in pastel is far more tactile because your hand is butted up right against the paper. So for an artist who can rely less upon his vision, that sense of immediacy to the surface would have been something he might have appreciated. Uh, and you do work with your hands. Pastels can be smudged and blended, but they ne the colors never fully blend together. They always sort of retain their independent identity. You could see that, for example, when you look at the detail of the white picture over here with the blue strokes in it. Now, um, Degas is working in a very sort of unfinished looking style here as well. Um, he's layering um, the pastel on top of each other in multiple layers. So some sort of fixative would have had to have been um, applied in between those layers. But the image that we see laid down is laid down in what we call hatches or hatch marks. Hatches are when the artist makes a series of parallel lines. Um, traditionally in art, we see those parallel lines used to create modeling or light and shade. But here he's applying all of the color in these big parallel strokes, which give it this sense of the unfinished. It calls attention like artists have been now been doing since realism to the fact that this is not a study of a nude woman bathing, but rather it's um, pigment on paper that we're looking at. It calls attention to its facture, like you can see the hand of the artist in motion. 
In any case, this is a work that um, Degas exhibits in the eighth and final Impressionist exhibition, along with um, seven other pictures of the same subject, of the, the bath, which had its roots in tradition, which I'll show you in a moment. But this was a strikingly interesting picture. We see this nude woman. Um, we see her from a bird's eye view as if we're standing over her. So it has this sense of voyeurism. We're looking at her, but she doesn't see us. And we see her crouching in a tub, presumably to wet her sponge. And then she balances herself on her left arm while with her right hand, um, she washes her back with a sponge. It is this wonderful off-centered composition, though. The woman doesn't occupy the center. And in fact, the, the right-hand quarter or third of the sheet is taken up with a very separate image. And these images look totally distinct from each other. We see this vertical white plane descending into our space with objects from a still life on top of it. And in, at first glance, these two halves of the work don't appear to be related. They're related by color. Um, for example, we see this reddish color, reddish brown of the woman's hair, which is the same as the sponge she holds. And those same colors are picked up on the right hand side of the work in the copper pot, as well as in the fake hair that's laying on the table. Um, but other than that, these two sides are quite different. That is a table on the right hand side, but it doesn't look like a table um, because of the way it vertically breaks into our space without any context. It could be a vertical wall as much as a table. So the picture has on the right hand side this oddly flat perspective, and that's at odds with what we see on the left. So on the left, it looks quite three dimensional. We could see the cast shadows under the woman and her arm. We can see the shadow caused by her torso on her leg. Um, but on the right hand side, the figure, the objects seem to be locked into this two dimensional design. That's particularly noticeable in these two pictures. The white one is quite a bit in front of the copper pot in space. If we picture this as a three dimensional space and yet um, this, these images, which by the way, are devoid of cast shadows, um, are interlocked with the handle of the pitcher sort of butting up against the curvature of the copper pot. So they look like a two dimensional design. Very little from the right hand side breaks into the space of the left. We only see the looping of the handle of the copper pot and the, the brush sort of oddly jutting out. So there's this wonderful tension between the three dimensional and the two dimensional at play. Now, I mentioned that the subject of the bathing, crouching woman here is quite traditional in an interesting way. And so like Manet, who looked back on ancient or Renaissance art, here Degas is looking all the way back to antiquity. I'm showing you one of many images of this theme of the bathing or crouching Aphrodite or Venus. So let me explain that for a moment. In very early ancient Greek art, you never would have seen a female publicly nude, maybe in private erotic art for the home on dishes and things like that. But if you had a statue of a god, he would be shown nude. If there was a statue of a goddess, she would have clothes on. Because in early Greek culture, there is this idea that the female body needs to be protected. I mean, this is a culture where women really didn't have a large role to play outside the home. Now, eventually, in later Greek art, we get the advent of the nude Aphrodite. But the first times we see Aphrodite nude, the artist like had to make up a justification for why she was nude. And so she was given a narrative reason for being nude. Well, what's that? She was coming out of her bathtub or she was bathing. So here you see the crouching Aphrodite. There is a water pitcher by her. Right. So now this is a later object that is a Roman copy after an ancient Greek image. So we're calling it the crouching Venus. But she's shown nude. She still is a modest nude. So she sort of covers up her body from our gaze. Degas picture, again, is not eroticized and, and there is that sense of voyeurism, but we don't see anything much of her nudity. But she takes on the pose 
of this ancient tradition, even though Degas is presenting her then in this very strikingly modern, everyday manner. Now, Degas was not only a painter and a draftsman, but he was also a photographer and he used photography in his painting as well. And he was a sculptor. Now that was not very sort of widely known because this is the only sculpture that Degas ever exhibited in his lifetime. Yet after his death, his studio was gone through and about 150 wax sculptures were found there. Uh, many of them were beyond repair. Um, about half of them could be pieced together and salvaged and cast into bronze. Um, I think though this is the only wax sculpture of the lot that remains. Now, if you think about it, just like we say that Degas, as he begins to lose his vision, switches from painting to pastel, largely, um, sculpture would have been interesting to him for the very same reason, in that it is insistently tactile. Now, this is another subject that we can talk about that were common to the Impressionists, which were interest in sort of public performance. So Degas and his father both loved music. They went to the opera and the ballet. They were friends with musicians. And right around 1870, Degas begins to study the ballet very intensely, and not just from the point of view of a spectator from the crowd, but he begins to sort of paint and study the sort of private life of the ballet dancer, watching them in rehearsal rooms and hallways, watching them warm up, watching them relax, and watching them as they prepare to dance in the wings. This was an outrageous sculpture when it was exhibited. Um, that's, we can mention something now that we're talking about medium. There is a hierarchy of medium. Sculpture is considered generally more important than painting. Sculpture was more expensive. Its tradition was one that, that, that was of value. Um, and very often works like this, which were made out of wax, were intended to be cast into bronze, which was one of the most expensive media of all. So the fact that he chose the subject here that he did would have been shocking, even more so than it was for a realist painter. Now, the subject we have here is an identifiable one. She was a student at the ballet school and she was a dancer named Marie van Gertham. She was working class. And she was studying at the Paris Opera. We don't really know what became of her. She's on the records of the opera for a while after this, but eventually she disappears. And the, the idea is that she probably had been expelled for missing practices. And we don't know what became of young Marie after that. But here we see her at age 14. Um, so she was one of this group of dancers. They were called opera rats. Um, a very derogatory term, which referred to the fact that they were usually young, pretty, but poor girls. Um, and very often, if you look at Degas' paintings, you will see top-headed hatted men watching the girls dance. And that's because very often these girls were sort of courted and stalked by older male sort of protectors who would take on the girls, fund their dancing in return for sexual favors. So the dancers had a very dubious reputation and that term of the opera rat um, certainly suggested, suggested as much. Now let's talk for a moment about medium because I have listed the many things that this is made out of. This was a sculpture that would have been made out of a metal armature. So something made out of um, metal rods and wires, and then it was filled out with wood, which might be the paint brushes and how they got involved in. And a lot of this can be seen by x-ray. And then there was rope inside of it to fill out the form and padding also to create the general shape of her body, which then all would have been covered over with clay and then finally with layers of translucent wax. Now, since 
ancient times, uh, wax had been used as a medium for portrait sculpture and for sculpting the human figure. Um, think about the fact that we have Madame Tussaud, right? When we make really close replicas, we often make them out of wax. And that's because wax has the same sort of translucency that human skin does. And so that is an ancient idea as a medium. And here he's tinted it a little bit to give it the sense of her flesh. He actually studied um, the dancer from like Marie. He studied her at least 26 times. And here you can see a sheet of drawings where he's looking at the figure from different points of view. You could see that very distinct posture. She has her arms uncomfortably placed behind her back and her fingers intertwined. So here he's studying her face from different angles and also the pose of the arms and the torso. Now, besides the medium of the dancer itself, this was really radical in terms of the fact that Degas included real clothing and real human hair on the figure. So the, the use of found objects in a high art setting would have been shocking. Uh, but he shows us the dancer this way. She's in this very stiff posture. You could see she's got her body very taut and erect. She's got one foot, her right leg out with uh, her foot turned 90 degrees and those arms clenched behind her back, her head very straight forward and her chin raised, which gives her all this kind of sense of dignity. She's not shown in repose, but is this very sort of stiff and formal pose. And when Degas presented this, the one time he did exhibit it, he had it actually exhibited in a glass vitrine, like in a display case, almost like it was an anthropological object rather than a high art sculpture. And um, let me just say, and as you may imagine, this was not very well received. It was called repulsive. It was called a threat to society. Um, one critic said the following, I don't ask that art should always be elegant, but I don't believe that its role is to champion the cause of ugliness. It is a wonderful work though, and it doesn't feel impressionist in every sense as a sculpture, but the sheer fact that we could see instead of brushstroke, the manipulation of the surface, Degas doesn't make this smooth. He leaves the evidence of his working and his hands on it. And we also see that shift in subject matter. This very much then fits into the same genre of what the painters were doing. Now, I've said that that is the only uh, sculpture that survives from Degas' studio. And so some of you probably said, wait, wait a second, I've seen this image. And in fact, I'm showing you Little Dancer aged 14 here in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Well, that is because that after these broken, damaged, degrading wax sculptures were found in Degas' studio, they were taken and they were repaired, the ones that were salvageable, and they were cast in bronze. And once you're casting in bronze, multiples can be made. In some ways, it makes the work even more shocking because bronze is a very expensive media that in tradition has been reserved for only the most important subjects because of the, the technical difficulty of making bronze and the expense of it. Um, and again, here that is transposed onto the opera rat. But it also is very interesting because it raises the questions of multiples and whether an artist has to touch a work of art for it to be his. The Little Dancer, aged 14, now survives in some 30 bronze copies, along with the one wax and two plaster versions. Um, so this example at the Metropolitan Museum was never touched by Degas, and it was cast only in 1922. The tutu itself is a modern replacement. So it is Degas, even though it's only cast from Degas. And that's an issue that we'll talk a little bit more about when we get to Rodin.